Well, good morning. It's good to see you all. We're going to go ahead and get started since we have a lot of ground to cover this morning. So if you would, please go ahead and turn in your Bibles to John chapter 5 and verse 4. And while you're turning to John 5, 4, let me welcome you to this class on the reliability of the New Testament text. Uh, I hope a lot of you were able to see the email that I sent out a couple of days ago that served as kind of an introduction to the class. We live in a culture that is rapidly growing more secularized and is also becoming more militant in its secularization. And one of the best ways to attack Christianity these days is to attack the Bible. And so our culture tells us that the Bible is nothing more than a document that's ancient, it was written by prehistoric people, and it's been corrupted in many ways throughout the centuries. The Bible is unreliable in its history we are told. It's mythological when it comes to speaking about Christ, and it's a book that certainly does not have any sort of authoritative message of God for us in the 21st century. So, today I hope that I'm going to be able to help us answer some of the questions that get thrown at Christians and show why we can trust that the, the English Bibles that we have today are indeed the same authoritative Word of God that was delivered to the apostles and to the early church and why we can have confidence that God has preserved His Word over the last uh, 2,000 years. So, we've got a lot to talk about. It's going to be a fast-moving class, and I, I apologize in advance for that. So, if you're, if you're taking notes and you're despairing of, of keeping up, I'll mention that there's going to be at least, there's going to be five key points in understanding the transmission of the text and why we can understand that the Bible is reliable. So, you can, you can keep a lookout for those. So, um, uh, let's, uh, let's go ahead and open in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this opportunity we have to take a look at your word and to understand how it came to us over many hundreds of years. We thank you that you have preserved your word, that it is reliable and authoritative, and that we can trust it. Thank you for all that you have done for us, and I pray that this class will be useful in dealing with some of the issues that we have to think about. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. The Bible was not given to the church in the form of a book that floated out of clouds that had God's incorruptible, infallible Word in it. The Bible came to us when God spoke through the writings of the apostles, and it was transmitted throughout the centuries of history by Christians making copies of those documents that the apostles wrote. So if you lived in Corinth and you wanted to have a copy for yourself of the letter that Paul had just written to your church, then you would make a handwritten copy of that and keep it. Or if you were a visitor maybe from Jerusalem to Corinth and you saw that you had some letters from the Apostle Paul, but here was a new one that you hadn't seen before, then you would make a copy of that letter and take it back to your church in Jerusalem, and then people would begin copying it there. And so that happened with all the epistles and all the books of the New Testament, it began to spread across the Roman Empire, and because the Christians making copies were people like you and me and not trained copyists, they sometimes made mistakes in the process of doing their copying. And sometimes they were little mistakes, and sometimes they were pretty big mistakes. And so it's that factor of church history that we have to deal with that brings up some tough questions that Christians have to answer. And so here's the first one that I want to bring to our minds. Since you no longer have the original New Testament documents, and all you have are error-ridden copies of copies of copies, how can you possibly say that you know what the New Testament originally said? And now here's an example of that from a group called the Jesus Seminar. And, and don't be mistaken, the Jesus Seminar is a heretical, left-wing, um, anti-New Testament, anti-Christianity organization, even though it's called the Jesus Seminar. Even careful copyists make mistakes, as every proofreader knows. So we will never be able to claim certain knowledge of exactly what the original text of any biblical writing was. That's the assertion being made. Here's another question that we have to answer. How do you know that some early church council didn't change the New Testament by leaving out doctrines they didn't like or by inserting doctrines that into the text that hadn't been there before? And here's a form of that question from a book called Holy Blood, Holy Grail. When Constantine commissioned new versions of these New Testament documents, it enabled the custodians of orthodoxy to revise, edit, and rewrite their material as they saw fit. 
It was at this point that, the most, that most of the crucial alterations of the New Testament were probably made, and Jesus assumed the unique divine status that he has enjoyed ever since. Now, this book, Holy Blood, Holy Grail, would become the basis, or one of the bases, that Dan Brown used when he wrote his very popular book and movie, The Da Vinci Code. And that's one of the central points of The Da Vinci Code, that Jesus, up until about the fourth century, was just considered to be a human. He had wife and kids, just like everybody else. But the Council of Nicaea in the fourth century decided they need to make Jesus divine. So they changed the scriptures, so suddenly Jesus became divine. And now we think that's what the original said, but really, it was a later addition. Here's the third tough question. How can you say that you have God's word when you have Bibles that disagree with each other on what the words of the New Testament actually are? Now, I don't have a quote for this, but this does go back to how we started the class. I asked you to turn to John 5 and verse 4. Now, how many of you were actually physically unable to do that? Okay. There's a few of you there who were unable to turn to John 5, 4. You guys probably have ESV Bibles. And the reason for that is this. Here's what John 5, 4 looks like in the King James and the New King James. In these lay a great multitude of sick people. This is the pool of Bethesda area, blind, lame, and paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool, stirred up the water, and then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now, a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. That's the King James, the new King James. If you have an ESV, it looks like this. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. And then there's no verse four at all. Skips right to verse five. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. So what is going on here? We've got two English Bibles and one of them is missing a verse entirely. What is the discrepancy and how do we explain it? I'm not going to answer that question, at least not right now. I will come back to it later, I promise. But this is some of the things that we have to wrestle through as Christians. So with all of these attacks that are being made on Christianity, what they are focusing in on is the fact that in the process of copying documents over the centuries, we have what are called textual variants. What is a textual variant? A textual variant is simply any place where two manuscripts differ from one another. So for instance, we've got one manuscript of Acts 16, 31 that says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. But there's other manuscripts that say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Now, obviously this is not a major textual variant, but it is a variant. Two manuscripts that do not agree with each other. And so we have to figure out which one of these is the original that Paul wrote. And so the process of dealing with the textual variants that we have is called textual criticism. What is textual criticism? Textual criticism is the process of taking multiple copies of a document that differ from one another and trying to determine what the original document said even though that original document no longer exists. Now, the methods used in textual uh, criticism, they can be complex. There's kind of a lot to it. There's many methods to determine the best reading among different manuscripts, but one that we can kind of grasp fairly easily is this. Which documents are older? Generally speaking, we're going to prefer documents that are older. If you've got a manuscript from the third century and one from the 15th century, and they're different from each other, you're generally going to want to use the third century one. There's, it's closer to the time of the apostles, less time for errors to creep in, whereas in the 15th century, there could have been a lot of errors that percolated down to it. So in general, we're going to prefer the older reading. That's one of the methods used in textual criticism. Now, I want to at least point out, though, that textual criticism, even if you haven't heard the term, is something that we do all the time. For instance, you're probably doing textual criticism right now as you're looking at this slide behind me, because I've made a lot of mistakes in it. Look up here. I misspelled the word multiple, and I also misspelled the word determine over here, and the word original actually fell off the edge of the screen, as if the manuscript was just destroyed at that point. Now, in the process of reading this error-filled document, you did textual criticism to correct it and get back to my original, which is 
missing, apparently, and you did it without even thinking. So if you did any of that and saw any of that or didn't even notice and corrected it, then congratulations, you are doing textual criticism. It's something that all of us do, and it's what's used to get back to the original manuscripts. So, I, so for a minute, let's take a look at the history of the transmission of the text in the New Testament in the first few centuries. Here's the, this green here kind of shows the extent of Christianity in the first century and then the extent in the second century. So, for instance, you might have uh, the Apostle John here in Ephesus, and he would be writing, say, the book of John. And when he's finished, he sends a copy of it to Jerusalem, and then perhaps he'll send a copy over to Antioch. Uh, maybe someone makes a copy from Jerusalem, it goes down to Egypt. More copies get sent up northwards, maybe over to Philippi. And so in that process, the Gospel of John is beginning to spread across the, uh, the Roman Empire. Similarly, over here in Rome, you've got Paul who's writing, let's say, the book of Ephesians. So he's going to send a copy over to Ephesus, and then it's going to be copied to all of the churches there in the Galatian regions. Again, maybe a copy will go down to Jerusalem. Maybe someone's visiting from the Egypt area, and they'll bring a copy back to their congregation. And so the documents are spreading here rapidly in the first and second century. Again, here's, here's Jerusalem. Maybe you've got uh, James there, and he's writing the the book of James. And so as he does that, his book will be sent off to Antioch, to Egypt. And so copies will be made and then copies of the copies will be made. And so there's this widespread rapid distribution of New Testament texts across the entire Roman Empire. And this all happens very rapidly. Now, this is in keeping with the great commission that was given to the disciples. They were told to go and preach to all nations and make disciples of them. And so in the process of doing this, they are using their scriptures. They are very happy for their scriptures to be copied as rapidly as possible. What that means is that if you wanted to make a copy of the book of Galatians for yourself, they didn't check to see if you had a scribal official professional card with you. You didn't have to be an expert copyist in order to do this. They would allow anybody pretty much to make a copy of their scriptures. And the side effect of this is that Christians made mistakes sometimes. They weren't always the most careful copyists. But Christians wanted their documents spread rapidly. And it's also important to remember that this is all happening during a time that the church is under persecution. We'll get back to that a little bit later when it's important, but the first, up until the first, about the fourth century, there was on again, off again, mostly on again persecution. So Christians are being run out of their towns, run out of their homes. They're taking their scriptures with them and they're still making copies of it. And when we're talking about the documents used in, uh, in the copying of the New Testament, there's mainly two of them that we want to talk about. Papyrus is the oldest form of documents that we have, papyri. Papyrus was a material that was very cheap and easy to obtain, but it was also very brittle and easily damaged. The edges of it would kind of break off. And being made out of plant material, the papyrus plant, it would decompose quickly. So if you had papyri in Rome and in Philippi and up north, generally it's going to fall apart and decompose pretty quickly. In the desert areas of Egypt and Arabia, there's a chance it'll last much longer. And so the papyri we have today generally come from that desert region where it could be preserved. Here's some examples of what papyri look like. You can see that they are fragmentary and broken. Um, this one over here on the left is probably one of the single most important documents of the New Testament that we have today. It's called P52. It's small. It's only about the size of a credit card. But it is the oldest document of the New Testament in existence today that we know of. And it's from the book of John. It dates to about the year 125 A.D., so I just show you that to let you know how important that particular one, P52, is. Now, as the fourth century came and Constantine rose to power, persecution came to an end and the peace of the church was established, Christians were able to switch from papyri to what is known as manuscripts, manuscripts and vellum, both of which are made out of animal skin and they are very, very durable. We have a lot more manuscripts than we do papyri. And again, here's a, here's a few pictures of them. Up here at the top is what we call a codex. Uh, it's like a modern day book. Pieces of uh, manuscript bound together in book form. 
And, and then the, here at the bottom are the single two most important manuscripts that we have in church history today. This is Codex Sinaiticus on the left, Codex Vaticanus on the right, both dating back to about 330 to 360 AD. May have been commissioned by Constantine himself. Codex Vaticanus is almost an entire New Testament, and Codex Sinaiticus is the oldest complete New Testament manuscript that we have. It has all of the New Testament, most of the Old Testament, and some other books as well. So I will refer to Codex Sinaiticus a little bit later, but I wanted you to see what these looked like. Very important, very great treasures of church history. Now, so copies are being made, and they're being made rapidly, and so textual variants are beginning to pile up. So the question is now, with all the manuscripts we have, how many textual variants do we have to deal with? The answer to that is that we have over approximately 400,000 textual variants, which sounds like a really scary number, given the number of, there's only about 138,000 words in the New Testament. And yet, we can we can mitigate this somewhat by pointing out the fact that we have a huge number of manuscripts, Greek manuscripts. We have over 5,700 of them. Now, if I only had one copy of um, the, the Declaration of Independence, for instance, how many textual variants would I have in it? There'd be zero, because there'd be nothing to compare it to. If I had five copies, all handwritten, you might have a few errors here and there, but not too many. But the more manuscripts you have, the more textual variants you're going to have. It just makes sense that way. So we have 400,000 variants just because we have a lot of manuscripts, more than any other ancient work. In fact, we can even quantify that to some degree. Here's a, here's a chart I put together of other works of antiquity that are contemporaneous with the time of the New Testament. I mentioned that the New Testament has 5,700 Greek manuscripts. The first one is less than 50 years from the time of the writing. So in this case, the book of John and P52, the time between when John wrote it and the manuscript is less than 50 years. Now let's take a look at a, at a few other guys here. You may not know any of these names up here, but if you know anything about the Greek and Roman Empire, if, you know, if you've seen the movie 300, uh, if, you've, if you know anything about Greece and Athens and Sparta, Julius Caesar, then you probably have these guys to thank because it's from their, their histories that we know most of what we know about the ancient Greek and Roman world. How many manuscripts of these guys do we still have? The answer is that it is a pitifully small amount of manuscripts. That's all we've got for these guys compared to the New Testament. And not only that, the time when those things took place and they were originally written about, and the first manuscripts that we have a copy of is a huge, huge gap. Anywhere from 350 to 700 years. So the Bible is, the New Testament is light years better than any other ancient work of antiquity out there. We know more and have better attestation of Jesus of Nazareth than we do of Julius Caesar, or Aristotle, or Socrates, or Plato, any ancient figure, not as much information we have as we do about Jesus. But anyway, we are still dealing with the fact that we've got 400,000 textual variants to deal with. But let's take a closer look at this and see if we can begin to break some of these down into different categories. And the first category that we can put up and immediately eliminate as a problem is 70% of them which we classify as spelling differences and nonsense errors. Now, here's an example of that. In Acts, I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians 2.7, it says in your Bibles, but we were gentle among you like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. Now, in the Middle Ages, some poor scribe just whiffed it and got the wrong word entirely. And so they wrote, but we were horses among you like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. Now, this can immediately be recognized as not the original thing Paul wrote. This is a nonsense error made by a tired guy, and we can eliminate this kind of thing easily, and 70% of textual variants fall into that category. But we can do even more than that. Another 20% of textual variants fall into the category of those things that do not affect translation. In Greek, the word order can be moved around. You can have the verb and the direct object, or maybe the direct object and the verb. And technically, that's going to be a textual variant if manuscripts don't agree in that way. But the English translation is going to be exactly the same. 
So 20% of textual variants do not affect the English translation at all. In addition to that, there's another 9% of textual variants that we would call meaningful but not viable. Meaningful in the sense that it changes the text somewhat, but not viable in the sense that it has no possibility of actually being the original. Here's an example of that, and this comes from, a, um, no, I'm sorry, this is a different one. This is 1 Thessalonians 2.9. It says, well, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. Other manuscripts say, well, we proclaim to you the gospel of Christ. Now, the difference between God and Christ is meaningful. There is a difference in that. But the one on the left here comes from the third century. The one on the right comes from the 13th century. You remember we talked about how, generally speaking, we're going to prefer the older manuscripts. So you've got the third century reading, the 13th century. The chances are is that the, one, the third century one is going to be the original. Because if it's not, what you're saying is that uh, Paul originally wrote Christ, and then everybody up until the 13th century for a thousand years just blew it and got the wrong word until finally somebody in the 13th century got it right. What is the chance of that happening? It's, it's not. It's just not the way the textual transmission is going to be. This is a meaningful error, but it is not viable. It does not have any chance of being the original thing that Paul wrote. And 9% of textual variants fall into that category. That only leaves then 1%, which are errors that are meaningful and viable. And I'll get to that in just a minute, but I want to at least stop right here and give the first key point that I want to make about the reliability of the New Testament, which is this. We have 400,000 textual variants, 99% of them are utterly inconsequential, and we don't have to worry about them at all. Now, meaningful and viable means that it is a meaningful change to the text, and it has a possibility of being the original. Here's Romans 5.1, a text that we've been studying not too long ago. It says in your Bibles, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. But there are manuscripts, and a lot of them, and old manuscripts that will say, Therefore, having been justified by faith, let us have peace with God. Now, this is a meaningful difference, and for various reasons, textual critics have determined that the reading on the left is the original one and not the one on the right, and so that's why all of our English Bibles will say this one. But another question to ask here is, what is the doctrinal differences between these two statements? If Paul originally said, we have peace with God, then he's probably talking about our positional status before God. We've been justified by Christ. Now we are in a state of having peace. If he wrote the one on the right, then what he's probably saying is for the Christian, he's commanding them to enjoy the state that they have of peace with God. You've been justified. Now enter into that experience of peace with God. And both of those are biblical statements. There's, there's a difference in the text, but none of them affect any Christian doctrine because we can find that kind of thing through other New Testament scriptures. And so the second key point that I want to bring up is that of all the 400,000 textual variants that we have, absolutely none of them affect any essential Christian doctrine. Zero percent of 400,000 affect any Christian doctrine. All the doctrines of God, of man, of sin and um, a, a redemption and uh, the death, burial and resurrection of Christ, all Christian doctrines are not affected by any textual variant. Now, uh, so let's, let's take a look at some of the scribal errors that actually were made in this copying process. So we can begin to see how some of this would have happened. And you can see I made a scribal error on my slide itself. I didn't do that to be funny. I actually typed that in. And it made me realize that if, if I'm sitting in front of my computer in a well-lit room in a comfy chair, and I can still make a scribal error when I've got spell check, <laughs> then how much more likely is it going to be that a Christian who's on the run from Roman authorities hiding out in a cave somewhere with bad eyes and reading a poorly written manuscript in bad light when it's hot and stuffy and there's mosquitoes around. He is going to tend to make more errors than we do. And so it's just a fact that that's the way it is. Textual errors were made. So the first type of scribal errors that I want to mention is called permutations, letters that are hard to distinguish from each other. 
our Bibles say at Acts 15, but Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. But there are some manuscripts that say, but Paul received Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. Now, what's going on here? Well, let's take a look at this in the Greek. And I apologize right up front because I do not speak Greek. I don't write Greek. I don't read Greek. So as I pronounce these things, I'm going to whiff it. And I apologize to any pastor, Pastor Fisher, Pastor Hendricks, I think is listening online. Sorry, I'm going to blow it. But anyway, the word for chose is epilexaminos. The word for received is epidexaminos. And you can see where the error would occur. The difference between the two is only one letter. In fact, it's not even just one letter. It's one line, isn't it? Just one stroke of the pen is the difference, a line there. Remember the papyri that we were looking at earlier? What do they look like? They've got lines on them. The plant material just has lines in it. And it's not hard to see how a scribe would see this and see, ep he'd see the lambda here and he would think he's seeing a delta here and suddenly epilexaminos chose becomes received. Permutations were a very common kind of scribal error. Here's another type. It's lines with similar endings. And we can see that in a passage that we've studied not too long ago. We're going to be singing a hymn about this passage later tonight. 1 John 3, 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us. That's what it says in your King James or your new King James. But if you have another translation, then it's probably going to say the same thing. And it's going to add this phrase here. And such we are. Now, what's going on with that? Well, to answer that question, let's go back here to Codex Sinaiticus, the oldest New Testament that we have, and take a closer look. This is a page of 1 John. Let's zip down here to the bottom where 1 John 3, 1 is. Now, you can immediately see that this text of the New Testament uh, of John is written in what is called Greek unseal style. Unseal means that it was written in all capital letters with no spaces between the words and no punctuation at all. I have no idea why they thought that was a good idea, but that is the form of literary Greek for many, many centuries. And so that's what the scribes got to, got to deal with. I put some lines under there just so you could sort of see how the words are broken up on this page. So, so here's a portion then of 1 John 3, 1. I, I took from that and it looks like this. <clears throat> Technotheu, children of God, Claythomen, that we should be called, Kai Esmen, and such we are. Now, have you spotted the error yet that the scribe made? Because remember, if you're a scribe, you've got your original here, you're reading it, and then you're writing your thing here, you're going back, you're reading, and then you're writing it here. So what happened is that, that the scribe made this particular error. He's writing in Claythomen, and so he writes in M-E-N. Then he comes back to the text, and he sees M-E-N, and he picks up his writing from there. He doesn't realize that he's missed an entire phrase, Kai Esman, and such we are. That is the error of lines of similar endings, and it happened all the time. And so suddenly... Manuscripts don't have that phrase in there. And the manuscripts that made their way into the King James and the New King James do not have that phrase. While Codex Sinaiticus and others, much older Bibles, still have that phrase in there. So that's, that's the story of how that phrase disappeared in some Bibles and not in others. You might have also have errors of hearing. Sometimes you weren't copying by taking a document and looking at it, you'd be in a scriptorium uh, in a monastery somewhere, maybe with five other guys, and a monk is reading out a passage to you, and all five of you are making copies of it. That's a good, efficient way to do it. But it also meant that if the scribe messed up his pronunciation, or you just misheard him, you might be writing in the wrong thing. And that sort of thing happened as well. Words sounded the same. They got mis miswritten. Another error is what we would call expansion of piety. And it looks kind of like this. This was a phenomenon of mostly the Middle Ages, where suddenly sacred words about Christ or God begin to get expanded. Jesus becomes Jesus Christ. 
our Lord Jesus becomes our Lord Jesus Christ and so on. Now, whether this was because scribes were trying to safeguard the deity of Christ or just wanted to uh, use more flowery language to describe God, for whatever reason, this is a factor, especially in the Middle Ages, expansion of piety, another kind of scribal error. This one was actually sort of an intentional one. Maybe. I mean, you could unintentionally do it, but a scribe might sort of intentionally do this one. And then there's other scribal errors. I won't go into them, but the last one is just sort of a catch-all phrase we would call errors of judgment. And the example for this one goes back to what we dealt with earlier, John chapter 5 and verse 3 and 4. The New King James has this. The ESV omits it, and if you have an NASB or an NIV or something else, you've probably got it, but there's brackets around it that indicates that there's an issue with it. The answer is probably the oldest Bible, the answer is that the oldest Bibles we have do not have verse 4 or the last half of verse 3, but it was probably a story going around at the time explaining the man, verse 7, says, I have no one to put me into the, the pool. And a scribe reading that probably said, people aren't going to know what that is. But he knew that there was this legend about the angel stirring up the water. So maybe he writes in the margins a note about why he was there waiting at the pool. And then that scribe's gone. Someone's copying his manuscript later. And they see this note in the margins. And they're not sure whether or not that's actually the original part of scripture or not. And so at some point, a scribe sees that marginal note and scribes being generally conservative people who are going to leave things in if they're not sure. This scribe copies that in as well, and he copies it right in line with the rest of the text of John. And suddenly a new verse has appeared in the Bible. What was a marginal note has suddenly become a verse. The oldest manuscripts we have don't have that verse in there, but the manuscripts that eventually made their way into the King James and the New King James do have that verse in there. That's why it's missing in some Bibles and it's present in others. So that is an, uh, an error in judgment type of scribal error. Now, all these errors are being made and... Sometimes there's a lot of errors that we have to deal with. This is what the textual critic has to do. But in the process of making these errors, it also demonstrates something else that is really important to understand for the New Testament transmission of text, and that is this. The third key that I'm going to mention, it's this. The New Testament was never controlled by a central authority. Remember what I said about Christians allowing people just to copy their scriptures? There was never a pope or a council who was controlling the text of the New Testament. Only certain people were allowed to copy it, and they were going to make sure that it stayed exactly the way they wanted. That did not happen. Now, that is a popular belief. There's a belief, like I mentioned in the Da Vinci Code, about church councils like the Council of Nicaea doing that very thing. So maybe in 325, when this council took place, they saw things in the Bible they didn't like, like reincarnation. So they decided, we're going to take it out. Or maybe you had Constantine, a newly converted Christian here, who decided he wants a Jesus who's human to be divine now because he wants to seem worthy of being able to serve this God. And so they decide to change Jesus into a God figure at that point. That's a central control author controlling authority for the New Testament. That is something that could not happen for Christianity. And why not? The answer is that this took place in 325. And by that time, the, Christian doc the New Testament documents had already spread so wide, so far, that there was no way for this council to get a hold of them and control them. When the Council of Nicaea met, there were already documents buried in the sands of Egypt of the New Testament that would not be discovered for another 1,400 years. Now, if we had these older documents that talked about a human Jesus and it had reincarnation in it, and then we've got the Council of Nicaea and everything after that that talks about a divine Jesus, and we dig up these older documents, what are we going to see? We're going to see discrepancies. Here's a document that says Jesus was a human. Here's one that says he's divine. What's going on here? But what we actually find, the older and older manuscripts that we dig up, is that the gospel that they believed in the second century was the exact same gospel that they believed in the fourth century. It has not changed. Councils, popes, other controlling authorities did not exist and could not exist in those first few centuries. Remember, Christianity was a persecuted religion. 
There wasn't a Pope to control things. Christians were running for their lives, just trying to survive. And yet they're copying their documents and they're spreading out such that nobody was able to control them. Now, interestingly, the idea of a centralized controlling authority for your scriptures is a very popular idea if you're a Muslim. Because 20 years after the death of Muhammad, the Quran began to experience some of the same problems the New Testament had. Textual variants are beginning to creep into their documents as well, and they did not like that. So what happened is this man, whose name is Uthman, is the third caliph of Islam, sent word to all the Islamic centers in the Arabian Peninsula and to all the people and commanded that all the Qurans be brought to him, all the printed Qurans. So they were brought to him. He set up a committee and they worked on these Qurans to try to figure out the best reading of them. And they created an official Uthmanic version of the Quran. And then he sent that Quran out to Islamic centers all over the peninsula and said, this is the Quran that you will use from now on. And then he took all of the Qurans that he had used to make that, took all of those manuscripts, and he burned them, destroyed every single one of them. Now, the result of that is that the Quran is a very stable document. There are very few textual variants in the Qurans that we have today. But do you see what it was that they lost in the process of this? Because if you're a Muslim and you have the Quran, then you cannot be totally sure that what you have are the words of Muhammad that he says that he received from Allah. All you know is that you have a Quran, which is what Uthman thought the Quran ought to say. And if you're a Muslim, you better hope that he got it right. Because if Uthman made any mistakes whatsoever, there's no way to know. All those manuscripts he used to make them are gone. The history of the Quran can be traced back to Uthman and no further. So you have to hope that he got it right. And so by having that stable, central, controlled Quran, controlled by the power of the sword, they get stability, but they also lose certainty that they really have the words of, of uh, Muhammad. Christianity does not have that problem. With the wealth of manuscripts that we have, we can say that we know what the Apostle Paul said, not what some later church council thought that Paul should have said. Now, someone might say, all right, you say you know what Paul said, but wait a minute, you don't have the original documents from Paul. You don't even have the first few copies made from Paul. Maybe the first, second, and third generation are gone. Now, the, the form of that particular uh, argument comes from a man whose name is Bart Ehrman. Bart Ehrman is a professor of religion at UNC, well known as a skeptical New Testament scholar. He's made a bajillion dollars writing books uh, attacking the veracity of the New Testament. And this is one of his main claims. How do we know that our surviving manuscripts were copied from accurate copies instead of thoroughly erroneous ones? How do we know that our earliest manuscripts were preserving accurate copies of accurate copies? The answer to Bart Ehrman's question is going to be what we call, this is our fourth key point, that multiple lines of transmission have preserved the text so that we can say that we do know the original even though we don't have the original documents. Now, in order to um, demonstrate what Bart Ehrman is saying and what we are saying in response to that, we're going we're gonna to do a little role playing here using our church and this sanctuary and we're all going to become scribes today. Don't, don't worry, I'm not going to actually make you do anything. But um, this, this is the demonstration I'm going to use. So this is me up here. This is the pulpit. I'm the Apostle Paul for today. And I've just written the book of Galatians. And so I'm going to take my book of Galatians. I'm going to come over here to Ken James. And I'm going to show him my book of Galatians. And he is going to make a handwritten copy for himself. And then Ken is going to turn around and show it to all the men on the row behind him. And they're going to make their own handwritten copies of his book. And then they're going to turn around and show it to the men behind them. They're going to choose one of the manuscripts and they will make a copy as well. They'll turn around and it's going to go all the way to the back of the room. Uh, every man making a copy back there. You got the picture there? This is the, so up here, we're going to consider this to be the earlier manuscripts, the first ones to the time of Paul, me, and the back ones are going to be much later manuscripts, copies of copies of copies. Now, here's the thing. 
first of all, we'll make these ones gray up here to indicate we no longer have my original book of Galatians and the first few copies are also lost to the, uh, to the mists of history. The green ones represent what we have now. Now, what happens if, let's say, Doug back there makes an error in his copy of the scripture? Let's, uh, let's pick this one, for instance. It, w- here's our first John 3, 1. And Doug messes up and he forgets the words and such we are in his copy. What's going to happen as a result? The result is that all the copies that get made as a result in Doug's line are going to have errors in them, right? The copies behind him and then the copies back there are going to have, are going to be missing that phrase. But we're not too worried about that because we've got other documents over here that don't have that problem. The phrase is still there. And in fact, we've got older documents that still have that phrase. So we can detect that error that Doug made and all the manuscripts that came after him and we can work around it. It's not a big problem. But here's Bart Ehrman's point. What happens if Ken James made an error in the very first copy and now his copy's gone? The result is going to be that every single document in that tree is going to have an error in it. And here's the thing. There's no way we're going to be able to know because the originals are gone. My original that had the right reading is gone and so are the first ones. All we've got now are manuscripts without that phrase and we'll never know that it actually existed. That's what Bart Ehrman is claiming about the New Testament. And if he's right about how the New Testament was transmitted, then he's got a point because this kind of thing is plausible. But let's change up the example a little bit. Let's go back to this here. And let's say I've got the book of Galatians and I also walk over to Stacy and I show Stacy a copy of it. And then she turns around and shows it to all the women behind her and they make a handwritten copy of it. And then those women turn around, the women behind them make a copy and then all the way to the back of the room, there's copies being made of Galatians. Then I'll come over here to Craig and I'll show him a copy of the New Testament of the Galatians and he's going to make a handwritten copy. He'll turn around to the men behind him. They'll all make a copy and then more copies until they go all the way to the back of the room. And then I'll go over to Peyton and I'll show her a copy and she will make it and she will show it to the women behind her. And in that way, it will go all the way to the back of the room as well. This is what we call multiple lines of transmission. You see now we've got four independent lines of transmission represented by the different colors that do not depend on each other. They're all copied from my original. Because remember, the original manuscripts would have stayed around for a long time. They didn't just go poof once Paul sent it to the Church of Galatia. It would have lasted for decades and many people would have been copying off of that. I've only got four lines of transmission, but there's a really dozens, if not hundreds of lines of transmission that we get. And so the result is that if the first ones are gone and Ken made an error and the errors go all the way to the end, we can still account for that because we've got three other lines of transmission in this example where Stacy didn't make the error, Craig, Peyton didn't make the error. And so we can detect it and we can correct it. And then, now maybe Craig made a different error somewhere else in his manuscript, but he didn't make the same error as Ken did. And when his error occurs, we can read the other lines of transmission, including Ken's, that don't have that error, and we can detect it as well. That is the benefit of multiple lines of transmission. The transmission of the Bible is not like the phone game, the old game where someone would whisper into someone's ear something and then they whisper to the next person and to the next person until it gets to the very end and it's usually pretty funny at the end because it's been so goofed up along the way. That's not the way the Bible works where one copy gets sent to the next to the next and an error comes in and then there's more errors until you get to the very end and it's just chock full of errors. We do not have a single line of transmission. We have multiple lines of transmission. And that also demonstrates what is going to be the fifth point that I want to mention to you, which is the concept of tenacity. Tenacity means that the original reading of the New Testament is still present. Now we saw from this that errors are tenacious, right? When an error occurs, it tends to persist throughout all the documents. But if errors can persist, then the original reading also persists in the different lines of transmission that we have. What that means, what tenacity means, is that we can be confident that the original reading of the epistles, the books of the Bible, are still there. We just have to try to determine what they are. 
Someone has likened it to having a jigsaw puzzle. A thousand piece jigsaw puzzle is what the New Testament can be likened to. And we have a thousand and ten pieces. We don't have 990 pieces. We haven't lost some of it. We've got all of the original readings in the manuscripts that we have. And then we've got some extra as well. So we can be confident that we have God's word. And now we just need to do the work to get the extras eliminated. So that's the concept of tenacity. So as we, as we start to wrap up here, what I want to do here at the end is show you the three biggest textual variants in the New Testament. And if you're talking with a, a reasonably informed atheist or Muslim, chances are they're going to bring up one of these big three. So I want to give you, give you these and explain to you why we have to deal with them. The first one is called the comma Johannium. And that is a fancy Latin phrase for the verses that appear in 1 John 5, 7, and 8. If you have a King James or a New King James Bible, this is what it looks like. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree as one. Now, if you have an ESV or an NIV or an NASB or most any other translation, yours is going to look more like this. For there are three that testify, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. Now, what is going on here? Uh, this, this tends to make certain people really upset because this has been in the King James for 400 years, and it's, it's a nice sort of proof text verse that you can use for the Trinity. It's nice to have the Father, the Word, and the Spirit all in one verse together. And so the question is raised, why is this missing from other Bibles when it's such a useful text? To answer that question, we need to go back to the year 1516 and take a look at what was going on in the life of this guy right here. This is Desiderius Erasmus. And in 1516, he was working on creating the first printed version of the Greek New Testament. The printing press had been invented in 1450, and he was going to get out the first printed edition of the Greek New Testament that took the best manuscript readings he could find and, and published it. And so Erasmus was doing his work, and he took the, New Testament, the Greek New Testaments that were available to him. Now, all he had to work with was about six Greek manuscripts, all of which dated to about the 10th century or later. Now, it's not that there weren't other manuscripts. That's just what he had access to personally. So he took these and faithfully compiled them and, and worked to get the best reading out of them. He published his Greek New Testament, which came to be known as the Textus Receptus in the year 1516. The Textus Receptus was very, very popular, but it did not include the Comma Johannium. And this outraged the Roman Catholic Church. Because the, the Comma Johannium was in the Latin Vulgate. Now, it, it had not originally been in the Latin Vulgate when Jerome first translated it into Latin. But over the centuries, the Comma Johannium had some, at some point entered the text. And so they said to Erasmus, where's this verse? We like this verse and we want it in the Bible. We want it in your Textus Receptus. And Erasmus protested and said, none of my Greek manuscripts have the Comma Johannium in them. And I even asked, wrote to my friend in Rome and asked him to look at Codex Vaticanus and see if it had the Comma Johannium. And it doesn't have it either. So if anyone can produce a Greek manuscript that has it, then I'll include it. But otherwise, I'm not going to do it. Well, lo and behold, a Greek manuscript was produced for Erasmus that had the comma Johannium in it. Now, it's interesting. The manuscript that was given to him had about 450 pages, all of which looked pretty much exactly the same, except for the page where the comma Johannium fell. And so it is believed by some scholars, at least nowadays, that that page with the Kama Yohanian was inserted at that point into the manuscript for the sole purpose of putting pressure on Erasmus. So whether that's true or not, we don't know, but Erasmus bowed to pressure and he put the comma Johannium into the third edition of the Textus Receptus. Then he also put in a long footnote about why he thought it really shouldn't be there. So... The Textus Receptus went through other revisions after that. Other men began basing their Greek New Testaments on it. And then finally, in the year 1611, the King James Version was produced. And it was largely for the New Testament based on the Textus Receptus. 
And you know the rest of the story from there. The King James Version became the most popular English Bible of all time, even still to this day, I think so. And uh, in 1982, an updated version was produced called the New King James. The New King James differs from the King James Version in two, two main ways. The first way is that it has updated language. It took out all the these and thous and things like that and some of the archaic language and updated it for us. The second way that it differs I will get to in a minute. Because you see, there was a lot going on between 1611 and 1982. The work on Greek scholarship continued. We began to understand Greek syntax and language better. The, old, the New Testament Koine Greek, we just got a better understanding of it. And more and more manuscripts were being discovered including things like Codex Sinaiticus, which wasn't discovered, rediscovered until the 19th century. 19th century brought an explosion of documents found in Egypt and elsewhere. So we get to the modern day where we've got, like I mentioned, some 5,700 Greek manuscripts. And in 1898, a new Greek New Testament was published that took the readings of all of these manuscripts, old and new, and sometimes other language of manuscripts as well. And that translation of the Greek New Testament became called the Nestle Holland Greek New Testament. Nestle Holland is still being updated today. It's up to the 28th revision. And the Nestle Holland has become sort of the gold standard of a critical Greek New Testament that takes the best readings that can be used by translators to see why they made their decisions of what words to use. And that has become the basis for almost all of the modern uh, English Bibles that we have. The RSV, NASB, NIV, ESV, the NET, uh, the New Living Translation, pretty much any other English Bible you can think of is based on the Nestle Holland. The Nestle Holland having access to some of those ancient manuscripts like Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, and others does not contain the Kama Johannium because the oldest manuscripts don't contain it. The Textus Receptus, which was based on Middle, uh, middle Age medieval manuscripts did contain the Kama Johannium after Erasmus put it in there. And that is the story of the Kama Johannium and why it's found in the New King James and not in, say, the ESV or the NASB. And it's also a brief history of the difference between the English Bibles that we have. Now, remember the second key that I said way back when. What doctrines are affected by textual variants? None of them. The Trinity is not dependent on the comma Johannium. We can, we can defend the concept of the Trinity without that verse. The Council of Nicaea in 325 could defend the Trinity, and they didn't have a comma Johannium. So, that is not, so no doctrine is affected if this is not part of the original text. That's the first major textual variant I want to mention. Here's the, oh, I'm sorry. There's one other thing I forgot to mention. The second difference between the New King James and the King James is the addition of footnotes, where the, the New King James will sort of acknowledge the scholarship that has taken place over the centuries. So in your New King James, you might see something where it'll say in a footnote, NU text includes this, or NU text omits this passage. NU, in this case, refers to the Nestle Holland. So that's the New King James by way of footnotes showing where the different manuscripts differ. All right. Now, the second major textual variant is the passage of the woman caught in adultery. In the New King James and the King James, this is found in John 7, 53, if you were looking it up. It's a well-known story, but if you have a NASB or the NIV or the ESV, you will find brackets around this section indicating that early manuscripts do not have it. So the question is, why is this passage not is, why is it considered to be a later addition to the Gospel of John? The answer is, the oldest manuscripts don't have it. It does not appear in any Greek manuscript until the 5th century. Now, remember the idea of tenacity. The original reading is preserved in the manuscripts that we have. If tenacity is not true, then what that means is that if John wrote this, then this is a text that could be lost in the Greek manuscripts for 500 years before somehow it was recovered in the 5th century. And that is not generally the way that the transmission of the New Testament works. So when it's not in the oldest manuscripts, there's reason to think that it's not part of the original. 
And even when it does appear, it does appear very early on in other languages like Latin or Syriac. But when it does appear, it sort of floats around in the text, appearing in different places in different manuscripts. Sometimes you find it earlier in John 7. Sometimes you find it at the end of John, even after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And sometimes it doesn't even appear in the text in John at all, but it will appear in a completely different gospel, in the gospel of Luke. Now, this text moving around kind of thing is a sign for textual critical scholars, generally that this is a later addition to the New Testament that is hunting kind of for a home to land. And it wouldn't be for many hundreds of years until it would finally land in the place where we have it today, John 53. So that's why scholars generally will consider this passage of the woman caught in adultery not to be an original part of the Gospel of John. Now, again, what doctrines are affected by the loss of this passage? There's none. There's no major doctrine that is dependent on this passage. We know that Jesus is compassionate on sinners, even without this. We know that the, the Pharisees were jerks, even without the story of the woman caught in adultery. We get that information elsewhere in other gospels. No doctrine is affected by this passage if it is not an original part of John. That's the second major textual variant. The third one is this, the longer ending of Mark. If you look in Mark, in your Bibles, in Mark 16, verses 8 through 20, you are going to have probably all of those verses, 8 through 20. However, if you have the Old King James or even the New King James, it's going to go through just like this, beginning after... And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week and so on. That's going to be there. In other Bibles, there will again be brackets around those saying something to the effect of some manuscripts do not contain anything past verse 8. And so that, uh, here's, here's what it looks like. I think this might be the way it reads in the ESV. There may be brackets, but otherwise it comes to verse 8. Trembling and astonishment had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The end. The end of Mark. Now, why is this considered to be a later addition to the Gospel of Mark? The answer is, once again, that the earliest and best manuscripts that we have do not have anything past verse 8 in them. And of the manuscripts that do have something after verse 8, there are actually multiple longer endings of Mark inexistent in the manuscripts. For instance, here's one of them. Some manuscripts end this way, for they were afraid. They reported briefly to those around Peter all that they had been commanded. After these things, Jesus himself sent out through them from the east to the west, the holy and imperishable preaching of eternal salvation. Amen. And there's a whole family of manuscripts that include this as the ending of Mark. And there's other variations. Some of them will have a little bit more. Some will take some of the verses in the, in the King James and have part of that. Multiple different endings of Mark. And so that is sort of an indication that when you read Mark and everything agrees up to verse 8, and then it kind of begins to diverge, that's a sign that perhaps verse 8 was the original ending of Mark. And it's not too hard to imagine that scribes reading this passage and seeing how it ends with them just being afraid would kind of want to smooth things out and maybe wrap things up. And so they would come up with different endings to sort of conclude the book of Mark. But another problem with this right here, and even the verses that are in uh, our Bibles now, is that none of the longer endings actually sound very much like Mark. Mark uses a particular vocabulary and a particular style, and these later endings just have a different style about them. So that is why a lot of scholars will consider the longer ending of Mark to not be an original part of the Gospel of Mark. Now, you might say, David, I don't like any of this. I thought that God had preserved his word, and I thought when, you, when he preserved it, that meant that my Bible was a 100% accurate copy of what the apostles wrote. And now you're telling me not only that there's a few words here and there that are wrong, but we've actually got entire passages that shouldn't be in the Bible. And if that's the case, how can you possibly say that God has preserved his word? Couldn't God have done better than all of this? Couldn't he have made sure that all the copies were produced perfectly and accurately so we wouldn't have to do this kind of thing? 
And so the answer to that question is, well, yes, of course he could have done that if he'd wanted to. But is that a reasonable expectation? Because think about what you will be asking or demanding that God would be doing in a case such as that. You would be demanding that God would be performing hundreds and thousands of miracles throughout centuries of church history to prevent even a single textual variant from occurring. So you've got a scribe who's tired. He's about to make a mistake. He's about to miss a phrase and he's going to write it. And God suddenly supernaturally causes him to wake up and realize what he's about to do and, and write the correct phrase or causes him to burst into flames so that he can't finish his manuscript. Whatever happens, God supernaturally causes that mistake not to happen. And we've got 400,000 errors, textual variants in the manuscripts we know of. We would be demanding that God in a supernatural way preserve his text all the way from the first century to today. And that is not God, how God has chosen to preserve his text. God has preserved his text it's true, and I believe that he has, but he has he's used a different means to preserve it. How has he done that? Well, let's just look at our, our five key points one more time. 400,000 textual variants, 90% of which are inconsequential. There are no essential doctrines that are affected by any textual variants. And there was never a time that there was a central controlling authority who was able to edit or change the New Testament text. We've got multiple lines of transmission, not just a single line, but lines going out all over the Roman Empire and tenacity, which guarantees that we still have the original reading in the manuscripts that we have. So the answer is that God has preserved his text. And the way that God has chosen to preserve his text is not perhaps the way that we think that he ought to have done it with some extraordinary supernatural means. Rather, he has preserved his word through the rapid, uncontrolled, widespread distribution of the New Testament beyond the ability of anyone to be able to control it or alter it or stop it. Christians were copying the scriptures all throughout history and it went out like an explosion across the, the Roman Empire and nobody could stop it. And so think about the results of that process that God has used. We have over 5,700 Greek manuscripts, not entire New Testaments, but manuscripts of testifying to the New Testament, 5,700 of them. If you count manuscripts in other languages like Latin or Syriac or Coptic or Armenian, we have over 25,000 manuscripts. That's 2.8 million pages of the New Testament. 2.8 million handwritten copies of pages of the New Testament, a copying process that spanned over 1,500 years before the invention of the printing press. That is the incredible history of the transmission of the New Testament. Incredibly accurate history. You could be, you could be forgiven for calling that a miraculous preservation of the New Testament. And so we believe that God has preserved his word. And that also means that we can be confident that the English Bibles that we have today are the word of God and contain everything we need to know in order to be right with God. Is this ESV Bible the word of God? Yes, it is. Is the King James Bible the word of God? Yes, it is. They differ in places, but they have everything that you need to know about yourself, your sin, the sacrifice of Christ, the possibility of redemption, and the way to be right with God. We have the word of God. We have everything we need to know. This is how God has preserved his word. This is why the text of the New Testament is reliable. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you so much for preserving your word. It's, it's a process that you guided, and even though it wasn't flashy, and sometimes there are uh, difficult things that we have to deal with, we thank you that we can see your hand guiding these men who loved the scripture. Thank you for these scribes, these persecuted Christians from the first century who were willing to risk their lives that we would have copies of the, of the New Testament. Thank you that we have it today in our language Thank you for the preciousness of your word that we can trust that it is authoritative, that it is reliable, and that it is your word. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.